Good morning. It's November 8th of 2020, and it is the Lord's Day. And today, as I promised, we will share communion, and we'll have communion uh, today in church also. But I'd like to read the sacred scripture concerning communion from 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 through 21. Some of you may want to shut down your machine and go and get some juice and this cracker and get prepared. So I won't wait for that because I know you can do it. But here we go. For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment to himself. This is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But we judge ourselves truly, so we will not be judged. I'm going to do something that I hardly ever do. When we serve communion, I usually speak from my heart, but today, I have written a number of things for this communion service. This year has been a difficult year for all of us. First, the COVID-19. It is a period of confusion of facts, differing opinions, and division within many churches. The virus itself has been more of an annoyance to those who have contracted it. But for some, it has been a painful and a fatal nightmare. Fortunately, those numbers are very few. However, they are no longer people who are over there or across the state, but have become people we know and love. It has infiltrated our community and the church community. Second, we have endured a contentious and divided national election. Many are discouraged today as the stakes were high in this election. Some are out of work as their supporting industries have been devastated. And perhaps some of you have personal struggles and pain that compounds all of this. In this environment, we come to communion, and I want to remind you of some things. In Psalm chapter 20, verse 7, the scripture says, Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 15 and 16, it says, By me kings rule and rulers decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles and all the judges of the earth. And in John 18, 36, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, that I might not be delivered to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world. Perhaps these scriptures today can bring us back to reality. Let us refocus on who we are, who our leader is, and what is our victory. Come on, dear children, come back to reality. Number one, we are the children of God. Number two, Christ is our Savior and our allegiance is to him. Number three, there is a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord 
And there is a day when we will live in a perfect land of justice and love. And today we are victors, and we live in victory because Christ died for our sins. And so we observe communion to celebrate, number one, the memory of his death, number two, the meaning of his death, and number three, the meaning to the entire body of Christ. Let us now in reality celebrate communion. And he took the bread and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, thank you for this that represents your broken body, but it represents a whole body of Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the same manner, he took the cup also after supper. And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, thank you for this that memorializes the shed blood of our Savior who died for us. This blood washes us, keeps us, and protects us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us now turn to our message for today. And our message for today is called Saved by Grace, as we are working through the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. <clears throat> I was distraught by the election, and so I went downstairs on my computer and spent the evening studying Saved by Grace. And then when I got done, I went to my bedroom, and this was on Wednesday night, and I got my smartphone, <clears throat> and I typed in him or er, Christian songs that include grace. And I could remember two of them, and I have a fantastic memory of hymns. And all the lists that came, and it had the words of it all, and that had grace in its theme. Maybe not its title, but its theme. And I spent the evening reading over again and again these lyrics of old hymns and modern songs that talk about grace. And when I got done, I realized that in my lifetime, I have used the word grace a lot because of all the singing that I've done in churches and such. And yet I realized how little I understood of grace and perhaps that I used the word lightly and did not comprehend the greatness of it. Grace is undeserved mercy. And so let us look at our text today <clears throat> in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. The first thing that I picked out of this scripture is the word opportunity. We have the opportunity to be saved, and that's what grace is all about. Let's look at the context. The context is creation. God created a perfect world without sin. The perfect utopia that all of you hoped as you vote will we'll get to in our country. God created it. But Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, and then God had a great decision, and his decision was, shall I destroy them or redeem them? And of course, God decided to redeem us. 
And what was his motivation for deciding to redeem us? I mean, it's no big thing for him to start over again. Not a big thing. But God is so filled with love, and he had so much love for not only Adam and Eve, but everybody that would be born of them, which is all of us. And so we see the preparation of God. He went to Adam and said, Adam, where are you? And Adam was hiding. They had put on uh, leaves to cover themselves because in their sin, they felt naked. And so Ad God gave them animal skins which is better than leaves in terms of clothing because, boy, a good wind and leaves would be in tough shape. But the animal skins represented the first blood sacrifice in the scripture, that there was atonement for sins. And then he cast them from the garden, and as they left the Garden of Eden, they went into a world of woe. He gave them the curses and the blessings. And the curse was this, that the man would live by the sweat of his blow, and the woman would be cursed with the pain of childbirth. And the other curse was that Satan would be there to tempt us with sin, but there was a blessing, and that is the seed of the woman would step on the heel of the serpent. And that is the first place in the scripture where we see the coming gospel of Christ. He went on with this preparation and creating the nation of Israel and pouring into them his laws and teaching them the legal aspects of repentance through all the aspects of the Old Testament temple and the sacrifices. And then he brought forth the prophets to preach the truth and more than that, to give the wonderful promises of the coming Messiah. And then came the birth of Christ and then the life of Christ, those four glorious gospels that are so exciting and so thrilling for us to read. And then came the cross of Christ, which is a day, can you imagine those disciples? They probably felt much worse than those who lose an election. The one they trusted in so much, the one that they followed for three years was crucified. And the election, as you think, would be done. It was over but he rose again. And he gave an invitation to all. He said, come to me. Ye who are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. As we read our text, it says, for by grace you have been saved. By grace simply means this, that you wouldn't have had a prayer if God hadn't given you the opportunity to be saved. Because there's no way you could fumble yourself into the door of heaven. There's no way you could find where it is. There's no way you can atone for your sins. There's no way for you to get right with God to even reach him. Unless he, by his grace and his mercy, gave you that opportunity. And that's why we sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Now, the second thing we see in the scripture, you're saved by grace, through faith. Through faith is the opening. We had an opportunity, now we have an opening. The opening for salvation. The word faith and believe both come from the Greek word pistis. If we look in James 2, 18 and 19, the scripture says you believe that God is one and you do well, but even the demons believe and tremble. So the concept of belief that we see in John 3.16 is bigger than just acknowledging, I believe there was a Jesus, I believe there was a Christ, I believe in this, I believe in that, I believe in certain doctrines. That is not saving faith. What is saving faith? What is this opening? 
It is first belief, believing it to be true. But true belief, if you really believe it's to be true, you will trust and you will invest. I remember a day, a cold day in January, a snowy day, about 40 years ago, and I was out trying to make some money selling. And I came to this parts place on a lonely highway. No customers coming in and out. And I was trying to sell him a change of copy sign for $1,000. Well, he was talking about, yeah, it'd be a good idea, but you know, he didn't have the money and ta-da-ta-da-da-da. And, and in my brain, I came up with this idea. I was sitting there looking at him and I said, you know, in the last five minutes, there are so many cars that pass by here. And if you calculate that, you're open, what, uh, 10 hours a day. If you calculate that, that's umpteen cars a day that pass by here. If you had that sign, do you think it would bring 1% of them in? And he said, yeah. I said, well, that's so many customers. And all of a sudden, I could see in the man's face belief. I mean, before that, he said, oh, yeah, I can see that'd be good. That'd be good. But, you know, a lot of things would be good. I can't afford it. But when that belief came, I saw it in his eye, and I knew he was going to buy that sign. No matter if it was a cold, slow time of year, he was going to do it because it hit him that this could do something great for him. And so he not only believed, he put his trust and he invested. And I'll tell you what, when we believe that Christ is our only hope, we trust him and we confess we're sinners and give him our life. This what we do. The doorway to salvation is faith. But we need the opportunity to have the doorway. Without the opportunity, there is no opening. And without grace, there is no door to faith. That's why the scripture says we are saved by grace through faith. We're saved by grace because we wouldn't have an opportunity to make any choices at all if God had first not chosen. Which leads me to the third point, and that is offering. Grace is an offering. It is the gift of God, as the scripture says. The plan of salvation is a gift of God. The message of salvation is a gift of God. The messengers of salvation are gifts of God. The hope of salvation is a gift of God. The Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior, was our Christmas gift. The cross, as wicked and rugged as it is, was an gift of God, a gift of God. And the age of grace we live in, that age between the time when Jesus died on the cross and the time when he returns again, is an age when God is holding his arms open to all, saying, Ye who are heavy laden, come to me and I'll give you rest. This is an age of grace. When God is reaching out to us, that's a gift of God. And the heaven to gain is a gift of God. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. This is, we are saved by grace through faith. And then there's one last thing in this scripture. We are to omit self and works. You know, grace and works are two mutually exclusive. If you believe in Venn diagrams, they're two that never touch. They do not overlap. You cannot be saved by grace and by works both. And some people have a struggle with that. Some people can never seem to get saved because they don't understand grace. And they're always thinking, I'm not good enough. I'm trying to improve myself. If I do this, if I do that. But there are people who are saved 
who also struggle with these things. And they have an incomplete salvation and they are confused and they get themselves in spiritual trouble. So I'd like to share with you the symptoms of grace deficiency. Yes, this is a terrible disease. It is far worse and far more extensive and far more eternally fatal than COVID-19 ever panned out to be. It is grace deficiency. The first symptom of grace deficiency is I am self-sufficient man. I can take care of myself. I don't care who you are. You can't take care of yourself. You're in need of God and you'll never get to heaven on your own. There are some who say, well, I always did the right thing. Well, that's a very arrogant statement. Nobody always did the right thing. There are some who say, I receive Christ as my Savior, and I'm very happy for that. I am joyous for those who receive Jesus as their Savior, have a wonderful experience of salvation. But I have met people walk around, and it's just like a merit badge on their chest, and they're pumped up and full of pride, and that is a sign of grace deficiency. Because those who are truly saved and understand grace are humble and quiet people. There are those who say, I believe the right things and I am right. That's a sign of grace deficiency. And then there are those who say, well, I never did this. And I had a relative who had a list of things. She never went bankrupt. She never lost anything. She never had a credit problem. And then there are some other things I won't mention that she never had. And I don't want to get into that because it may, may make feel some of you feel bad. But nevertheless, she thought because she didn't do these things that she was a good person and was in. And that is a grace deficiency. And there are some that say, I lived a good life. And that is a grace deficiency. It's a great thing to say I lived a good life, but some of them think that's what's going to get them there. Or I'm a good person. And there's some just plain half stinking pride. What are the complications of grace deficiency? Well, one of the worst complications of grace deficiency is folks that have sat in church and heard the gospel all their life and can't understand basic salvation because they've got so much pride and they're trying so hard to work themselves to heaven. And some people, one of the complications is there are some that think they've sinned so much they can never be saved. And that is a complication of grace deficiency. They don't understand the overwhelming love and grace of God. Some have stunted spiritual growth as Christians. They're saved, but they're still digging at their works and trying to make themselves better, which I like part of that, and I like holiness and a pursuit of holiness, but some of them just don't understand the grace of God. Some of them are judgmental. They're always looking over at other Christians, and what's wrong with them, and why do Christians do this? I tell you, when you're really saved by grace, you're so thankful you're saved, you don't care about anybody else because you're broken. Another thing is a lack of a generous spirit. There are people who know and love the Lord and have received the gift of eternal life, but they're not givers. And they obviously have a grace deficiency. And then there are those who love the Lord and claim to be Christians, but they have a lack, lack of Christ likeness. And that is just plain grace deficiency. And then last thing is, is God is gracious and he was gracious to us. If we are not gracious, there's something wrong and we have a grace deficiency. The scripture says we are saved by grace through faith. We only have the opportunity because of the great grace of God who loved us and is by faith. In closing, I would like to say this. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? 
And I ask you today that Christ died for your sins and God planned so that you could be saved. Do you understand the concept of the great gift of God that he gave all that you might be saved? And have you received that gift and have rested in it? This is what God wants. And faith is the door. Grace is the opportunity. And I know I have given you the opportunity. God has spoken to me to speak to you through his word. I have laid the opportunity out. Have you walked through the opening by faith and said, I'm going to take that opportunity. I'm going to pray and ask Christ to be my Savior. I'm going to ask him to forgive my sins, and I'm going to believe from now on that he has done it. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you today for the peace that passes all understanding, for the joy and comfort that you give, and for your graciousness for the wonderful opportunity and the doorway we have to follow you and to have eternal life. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you.